This was uh, 67. And I was working at, uh, at the Wayside Theater in uh, Middletown, Virginia. And uh, David Ford was also uh, in that play that summer. And um, Nancy Barrett, his wife at the time, was, uh, was there too for the, for, for the one, one play. I was there for the summer. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, they recommended uh, that I see Dan Curtis when I got back to New York. And uh, David set up the meeting, and I went in and met him, and um, he hired me. Uh, actually, I was doing the play. I was doing a play in Pennsylvania <laughs> when, when I actually got the job. Uh, this was some months later. I remember uh, leaving the theater that night. I had to catch a train to New York from Philadelphia, and I had to leave the play without waiting for curtain call in order to uh, make it to the train on time. And as I, as I left the stage, everybody was saying goodbye and good luck to the character that I was playing, and uh, they were doubling it for my trip to New York to meet Dan Curtis. Well, I started off, of course, playing Tony Peterson, who is a real, you know, nothing kind of character. He didn't have any real background. He didn't have much of anything. Uh, and so it was a, a real nice change of pace to go into 1795 and become the evil Reverend Trask, who was, uh, who was my favorite of, of the three Trasks, four counting the butler Trask. But uh, he was my favorite simply because he was... Um, the purest. He was self-ordained. He was. He wasn't a bad guy like Gregory Trask was. I mean, Gregory had some real bad traits. He was a crook. He was. He was illegal. But the first Reverend Trask, I think, was just idealistic, and uh, he really wanted to catch witches and things. Um, so I like. I liked him the best. He was. Uh, he was the purest character, and also, uh, you didn't get a chance in those days to play those kind of roles. I mean, this was pure melodrama. It was, you know, just mustache twirling at its at its best, and uh, it was great fun to play. In my training uh, at Los Angeles City College, they at that time in the late fifties um, were adamant about theatrical discipline and discipline in the theater, and uh, that transferred over into television, of course. So when I started to work on Dark Shadows, I already had some training in that area, and it was uh, valuable that I had because it was very, very necessary to know your lines when you came in in the morning, and uh, the fact that, that we were what was called then live tape uh, made it uh, even more necessary. And so that discipline that I put into practice there was, uh, was uh, a, good, a good training ground for anything and everything that I did afterwards. The work was, was so intense. I mean, you know, there were only five actors, for the most part, on each episode. And we all had a tremendous amount of uh, dialogue to learn, especially when you had to do incantations and those, those you know, those were difficult to memorize. I was exercising a devil out of either, either Lara or, or Nancy Barrett. I'm not sure which anymore. 25 years. Um, and I went, I went completely up. I had not a clue uh, what my next line was. And the only, the only camera that I could see uh, to get my line from the teleprompter was behind me. And so my only choice was to just turn around and read the line off the, <laughs> off the teleprompter. We tried to avoid bloopers as much as we could, uh, unsuccessfully many times, but, but we tried. The, there was a giant hand. Barnabas's hand was, was after me in one scene. And uh, of course, you know, I couldn't see the hand. <laughs> that was being chroma keyed in, too. And uh, it's, that's, that takes, you know, some acting to, to run around a room being chased by a, by a giant hand that you can't even see. And uh, that's good training too. I mean, most, most shows you don't get to do that on. 
Uh, and of course, there was one time when, uh, when uh, Trask was looking at his reflection in the mirror, and the, the uh, reflection changed to a skeleton, and then the mirror exploded. And of course, the way it exploded was they had a stagehand standing backstage with a hammer, and at, on cue, he went bam like that, and the glass exploded, and a lot of it came forward, hit me in the face, too. I was. Uh, and then there was a time we almost caught the studio on fire. You know about that one, when, when we burned down Collinwood one time? <laughs> we knew it was, it was unique in, in the melodramatic uh, aspect of it, as I said, and um, it was uh, certainly uh, unique in its popularity. Uh, none of the other shows, especially the daytime shows, had, had throngs of people waiting outside uh, for the actors. So we had a pretty good idea it was, it was unique, yes. When I was uh, doing Play It Against Sam and Dark Shadows at the same time, it was, uh, well, it added. <clears throat> it added to an already rigorous uh, job by, by making uh, the hours. You know, I, I would have to, uh, to work on stage until about 10.30 at night, which is early by Broadway standards, but uh, still when you have to then learn a Dark shadow script and get up at 6.30 to be at the studio in the morning and uh, spend the whole day there and then back to the theater at night. It was, it was a tough job. But uh, I enjoyed it. I've always liked hard work. One of the things that I, I cherish most in my memories of Dark Shadows is of the people that I met and worked with. Uh, um, Joan Bennett, she was such a lovely, warm person, and, and uh, my first real association with someone who'd been a Hollywood star, and uh, it, was, it was so gratifying to find, you know, that she was real people and nice people and had a good set of standards. I left the show before, before it went off the air. Uh, about just several months, I'd been offered a job uh, on As the World Turns in in, uh, in the present, and, and you wore regular clothes with, with pockets in the pants, and uh, it sounded very attractive to me, and you talked uh, like a regular person, and uh, so I took that job. <laughs> We're all a little surprised at the, uh, at the length of time this interest has, uh, has carried on. I remember uh, John Carlin saying at one of, the, one of the conventions a few years ago that we were going to uh, we were going to do this for, for this generation, but, but from now on, <laughs> the kids are going to have to take care of themselves. <laughs>